in the farthest edge of Europe, with cliffs carved by the Atlantic, sits Portugal. This small maritime country once enjoyed a period of global supremacy thanks to the bravery and skill of its navigators. In this two-part adventure, I visit a special place in the heart of central Portugal, the Ribatejo region, where the Tagus River flows and gives life to a vast agricultural earth. The fertile lands of the Ribatejo is where the Order of the Knights Templar flourished and where Portugal's overseas expansion would begin. It also brought forth a rich horse tradition, resulting in the elegant Lusitano breed. Join us in the first part of this journey as I trace the footsteps of the Templar Knights, which leads me to the town of Tomar, finding out more about their vital role in Portugal's fascinating history. a chance to explore Lisbon before. A stunning, rustic city facing the Atlantic, built with the riches of the New World. The discoveries of the Age of Exploration would change the world forever. Central to this maritime expansion is Henry the Navigator, a Portuguese prince regarded as the initiator of this golden age which placed the country in a position of global supremacy. But behind Prince Henry's sponsorship of the expeditions was the support of a wealthy, powerful and mysterious organization, the Knights Templar. Founded in 1119 in Jerusalem, their role was to protect pilgrims journeying to the Holy Land. Their assets increased not just from donations, but through capturing Muslim lands. With this wealth, they established an early banking system which gave loans to traders and even kings. Later on, the Templars made some powerful enemies and members were persecuted across Europe. Portugal is one of the countries where they found refuge and continued their brotherhood under a different name. The Order of Christ, under whose symbol Portuguese ships sail. Everywhere in Portugal, we see their enduring influence and I will attempt to trace their footsteps and discover more about this mysterious order. Arriving in Lisbon, my first stop is the Aero Club de Portugal, one of the oldest flying clubs in Europe. It's always great to visit small airports and get to know the local flying community. Today, I will be taking a short flight with Francisco over one of the places near Lisbon that was important to the Templars, the town of Sintra. Full power. There you go, your aircraft. The instruments in the green. Finally, I get to fly a Charlie Shera registered aircraft. So this is have 160 or 100? 180. 180, oh, yeah. that's right, that's a little bit more powerful. Yeah, it's, it's very powerful. We decided to take the scenic route to see Portugal's dramatic coastline. So we do the shoreline? Yeah, we just follow this. You're doing perfectly. You're just going to follow that shoreline. It's the most western point in continental Europe. Already, huh? These are good, uh, nice little beaches that we we have really, really nice restaurants over here. So a nice day out with the family on weekends. A lot of people come here. A lot of surfing here too as well. 
These rocky cliffs may be the explorer's last sight of land before their journeys to the new world. From the coast, we went north over the city of Mafra, where a magnificent building is very visible from the air. It's the Convento de Mafra. Oh, Convento de Mafra. Mafra, yeah, this is Mafra. It's uh, very well known. The royal palace and convent is a world heritage site. It was built in the 16th century when wealth from the gold and diamond mines of Brazil flowed into Portugal. Finally, we headed back to fly over the Sintra Mountains, dotted with palaces. And there you have the Pena Palace, which is one of the most famous in, uh, in Portugal. The royal family used to live there. Flying over these historic places fueled my curiosity even more. But first, I hope I don't scare Francisco too much with my landing. I have a code for and, a while. And, you know what you're doing. Perfect. Nice. After seeing it from above, it was time to explore Sintra and unlock its mysteries. For centuries, Sintra's mountains have been revered as a mystical place and have attracted the rich and powerful to build their summer palaces here. One of them is millionaire Carvalho Montero, who bought this property in 1892 called Quinta de Regalera. He built an eclectic palace estate surrounded by wooded gardens, fountains, and towers. The main palace was decorated in Manuelin style, which celebrated the achievements of Portuguese explorers. But also scattered around the estate are symbols which reflected Montero's interests and ideologies, one of which are the Knights Templar. The area where the Quinta stands was actually Templar land, donated by the king centuries ago. Hence, Montero's interest in the place. One mysterious structure in the estate goes 30 meters down like an inverted tower what they call the initiation well. No one knows exactly what it is for, but it was believed to be how the Templars would initiate new members. So this is the start of the initiation well. One has to go down all the way up to the bottom and it must be very dark here uh, at that point. Let me see if I can do this. Of course, there's light. <laughs> I even have a cell phone if I get lost. Holding only a sword, the recruit would go down into the darkness. The Templars believe that they must descend into the earth so that they can be spiritually reborn when they come up again into the light. Adding to the structure's mystery were a series of underground tunnels connected to it, which could be part of the initiation rites. Which way do I go? During the initiation, they're given uh, this uh, intersections and you have to choose to pass the right way or else you're trapped. I think for today, I'll take this one. If the recruit finds the right path, he is led to the light where he can walk over this body of water just like Jesus did. He then makes his way to the bottom of this small chapel where he will officially become a Templar. Some say that the well and tunnels were originally built by the Templars themselves as a way of hiding their treasures taken from Jerusalem which included the famous Holy Grail. Could the Holy Grail be here in Portugal? Is this why Montero bought this property in Sintra? 
up next, there are more mysteries to unravel. And my journey takes me to central Portugal. The fertile Ribatejo region where the Knights Templar continue to exist as the Order of Christ, which would steer Portugal to global supremacy. I am still tracing the footsteps of the Knights Templar in Portugal. From Lisbon, I made my way to its central region following the Tagus River. The Tagus, or Tejo in Portuguese, is Iberia's longest river flowing from Spain and emptying into the Atlantic. The river's life-giving waters gave rise to the Ribatejo region, Portugal's richest agricultural land. Today, Paulo will take me to see an important Templar site nearby, which can only be reached by boat, the Almorol Castle. It's um, a very important the moment of the creation of Portugal because in the 12th century, yes. we have the, um, every territory today, Portugal and Spain, mm -hmm. occupied with the, the civilization, the Moors. Yeah. And so we have a, a big, important mission, the Christian Reconquest. The river was once the border between Christian and Islamic Portugal during the Reconquista and had to be protected by the Templars. The Templars used more the mines, mm. not only the forts. And in the moment of the creation of the castle, every territory in the north of the river is of Portugal, but in the south of the river, it's the territory of the Moors. More important, it's um, controlling not um, only the, the territory, the river, because the, the, that river the it passage, gets right? a passage, yes, of true. Everyone. Everyone, the boats, the peoples, use the river. And it's very important to knights, the Templars protected we sailed through fairy tale like scenes before finally reaching the Almorol Castle. It is one of several defensive fortresses on the banks of the Tagus River, but none of them compared to its enchanting presence. This castle, Almorol Castle, it's absolutely different because it's in the middle of the river in the highlands. And it's beautiful. It's very beautiful. The Almoral Castle would not be the only impressive structure the Templars left behind in this area. I continued on, driving towards a place which used to be the base of Templar High Command, the town of Tomar. I knew I was close to my destination when I pass this magnificent aqueduct towering over the landscape. The Pegoesh Aqueduct was built in the 17th century. Although it's a later construction, it served a very important purpose for the Templars' headquarters in Tomar. This aqueduct is 6 kilometers long and supplies water for the Convento de Cristo. The Castello and Convento de Cristo, the Templar seat of power, looms high over the city. The city of Tomar was founded by Gualdim de Pais, fourth grandmaster of Knights de Templar during the 12th century. Tomar may seem like a sleepy little town straddling the Nabao River, but it holds a special place in world history. It was built on land donated by the king to the Knights Templar. And the whole town used to be enclosed inside the walls of the castle. Its mountainous terrain and proximity to the river made it a strategic location to build a military fort. Walking around in the old center, you will find a charming medieval town 
with plenty of symbols relating to its Templar heritage. Before I explored the castle and convento, which is the centerpiece of Tomar, I decided to grab a bite first. I visited a medieval restaurant in the middle of the town. While in Tomar, I get to experience how a Templar knight has his meal. Wow, it seems like it's a lot. Feast. Royal feast, do I get to grow like a Templar knight and strong if I eat all of this? This for you go to the castle after. <laughs> in reality though, Templar knights follow the strict code of discipline, making sure they remained humble in service. They were only allowed to eat meat three times a week. We have the fried polenta. Okay. We have the belly pork with chestnut sauce. Okay, the that white sounds pork good. Pie, the beef with wheat sauce. Wow. And the cod fish. I think wild boar pie sounds good. Yes, I, I really like this. Enjoy. Thank you. Much. Thank you very much. Now, what do I start with? Everything looks good. The Templars, after all, were considered elite fighting units. And they had to eat well to be able to fight and joust all day. Historical records say they lived long past 60 which was double the average life expectancy in the Middle Ages. I wonder if wild boar pie is the secret, or was it because they drank from the Holy Grail? I could only manage a soft drink, but the food was rich and hearty, fueling me for the climb up to Mars Hills to discover more. Up next, I visit two of the most important Templar sites on Earth, which would write Portugal's history and that of the entire world. At the height of the Templar Knights' power, the organization wielded a strong influence across the world. Not only were they feared soldiers, they had also had a sizable fleet of ships, operated businesses, owned the island of Cyprus, and served as a banking institution to royalty. Tomar was an important Templar town that lay on the border of the Islamic South and the Christian North in Portugal. Because of this, the Templar Grand Master Gualdim Paez decided to build a fortress and castle to guard the city, what is now the Convento de Cristo. But before the castle was even finished, he decided to have a Templar church built as well, which I will visit first. The Santa Maria de Olival, named after the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, is considered the Vatican of the Knights Templar at that time. It is a very important Templar site because this is where the Grand Masters were buried, including Gualdim Pais himself. His tombstone can still be seen here. Over the course of Portugal's overseas expansion, Santa Maria de Olival would become the mother church of all Portuguese churches built abroad. But its real mystery lies beneath its floors. It is said that below the church are rooms and tunnels used for initiation and other Templar rituals. Some even claim that the tunnels are connected to the Convento de Cristo in the distance. Now, it's time for me to visit the Templar Fortress itself. The Convento de Cristo is one of the most impressive religious complexes here in Europe. It is the headquarters of the Templar Knights here in Tomar. Gualdin Pais was an accomplished soldier 
who fought against the Moors in the Middle East and in Europe. From his travels, he brought back with him architectural knowledge which he applied in the construction of many Templar castles including this one. It was built as a military fortress and stronghold for the Templars to show their might to the surrounding Muslim territories. Inside, one of the convento's many treasures is this impressive Romanesque church. The centerpiece of this church is this altar, which was inspired by the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. This charola is an octagonal structure supported by pillars separated from the exterior by 16 sides. It is richly decorated with paintings, carvings, and gilded stucco added over time. Legend has it that the church is circular because the knights attended the mass on horseback and this was the window or the door at the time where they entered. But in the 14th century, with dwindling support after the capture of Jerusalem by Muslim armies, the Knights Templar were persecuted across Europe. Except in Portugal, where they renamed themselves into a new organization, the Order of Christ. Tomar and the Convento de Cristo continued to be the headquarters of this new order. Henry the Navigator who became the Order of Christ's Grand Master, built a palace within the fortress. From here, Prince Henry laid out his ambitious plans for overseas expansion, funded largely by the Order. He also built a convent inside to be used by contemplative monks which he recruited as members. These quarters would be expanded and improved on by future kings. Today, we can still see the intricate workings of keeping a castle and convent running. From the central heating system, to a cistern for its various fountains, to the aqueduct that brings water from the mountains. But more than the engineering, there was beauty everywhere. Over the next five centuries, the convento would be renovated by different kings, bringing in their own brand of aesthetic. Manuel I, Manuelian style, would become a quintessential Portuguese architectural expression. Carved in stone are ropes, vegetation, and other exotic discoveries which represented the astonishing success of Portugal's age of exploration. From being a symbol of autonomy during the Reconquest, the Convento de Cristo would later on symbolize the opposite. Portugal opening itself up to other cultures. Walking along these halls, I could still imagine knights and friars going about their day as they moved along a rapidly changing world. In the next part of this adventure, I visit another area in central Portugal, the agricultural lands of the Ribatejo region where the majestic Lusitano horses have thrived for centuries and where a spectacular horse festival brings people all over the world in the town of Golga. This has been your captain, Joy Roa. See you in the next Asian Air Safari.